Hello, beautiful people. You're listening to the Communal Table Podcast, part of Food & Wine Pro. I am your host, Kat Kinsman, and my guest today is the fantastic George Mendez. He is a chef of Aldea, a cookbook author, a runner, and a heavy coffee drinker, (laughs) which turned out to be a problem this morning. I'm so glad you're with us today. I'm really happy to be here. Totally pumped. Thank you. Did the coffee help with the being pumped? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's really a maze of this building and how big Food & Wine is, expansive space that it is nowadays. Yeah, it's funny. We have a whole bunch of sister brands in here, too, and it's just, you know, it's growing and evolving. And I'm thinking when I first started to uh, talk with you, I was working at CNN at yes. the time. Yes, Yeah, right. and I remember I interviewed you at the Aspen Food and Wine Classic. That's right. So, uh, you know, I I don't know what order these uh, are going in, but sometimes I talk about the necklaces that I'm wearing. <laughs> and today, for people who can't see it, it's a little pizza box. <laughs> I, I at that point was asking chefs like, "What is your uh, food for a late night when you might be craving something?" And you, you, you were feeling some pizza, man. <laughs> hey, how did you know? <laughs> I'm. I, it's funny that you say that. Just ironically, last night I did go home and get pizza delivered. Okay, just, and good, does it good pizza, cruddy pizza? Does it's it... Neopol- Neapolitan pizza. Am I pronouncing that correctly? Sometimes I'm not I great. assume. <laughs> yeah, it, it, I just love the slightly doughy crust and uh, really super fresh ingredients. They're right down the street from from my apartment, and they're I've ha- I have it down to a science where I, if I'm on the subway or an Uber, I can come over the bridge, hit seamless. <laughs> I don't plug it. And 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 I sometimes they beat me to my door. Oh, that's like happened last to night. Me. That happens. I was, and the guys like call myself. I'm like, who is this? He's like, this is your food delivery. And it was that fast. Yeah, we have a place where uh, I will order at the bottom of the hill and they will be at my door by the top of of the hill. And it's such good stuff. People always assume that chefs are going to be eating super fancy things. This is not the case with any chef I know. We want want, um, express, we want speedy food when we get out of work. You know, we don't want to sit around and wait because I mean, especially going through a training cycle that I'm in right now, you know, hobbling along a little injured for the training for the London Marathon. But it's, um, it's. At, the, at night, after 12, 10, 12 hour day, getting home, I pretty much want to get to sleep pretty quickly and eat yeah. something kind of fast. So this day and age, we have all these food apps that makes things pretty, pretty too convenient, I must say. <laughs> so let's rewind 10 years. What were you up to right then? <sighs> wow. I was ten years. I was ten years younger. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, you know that was it. Was a really fun, exciting time. Um, uh, you know that was you know so we're going back to two thousand nine, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, uh, building the restaurant and scared shitless to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, this is your first restaurant. It was my first. Re- it's my first restaurant of my own. Um, creating an identity, creating my own voice. You know, I remember sitting down at a table with my partner and and people. People calling us crazy because at that time, 2008, 2009, we're economic crisis, the yeah. recession, and everybody was saying to us, "You know, you guys are crazy for opening a restaurant right now." And and I'm like, "Well, well, we got a sign lease. We've got <laughs> we've got the funding. We've got all this stuff moving forward. So there's no stopping us now." Yeah. And you know, it it was. I just had that adrenaline, and I I didn't really think about you know. Yes, I was scared, but I was like, I wasn't more excited. It was like this this nervousness of of being excited and getting to the kitchen and like. Finally, you know, I, I had this stove that I had bought used and I had it in storage and I was able to now have it in the space and I was just ready to cook. And it had been an 18 month search to have this restaurant and to open it. And I was excited. I was just super excited. It was like, I remember, I remember making a, a makeshift uh, table out of plywood and, and um, sawhorses, you know, because it was just like, still a construction zone. And the restaurant yeah. was pretty close to being finished. And uh, a dear friend of mine, uh, John Sconzo, wanted to have his birthday party. He's like, I want you to cook at my birthday party. Can we do it at Aldea? And I was like, well, I don't have gas. <laughs> um, we've got electricity. So technically, I can cook on the plancha. Um, and that's what we did. We did. This, it was my. It was that kind of a thing happening. And it was. We were. The team and I were just so hungry to get started, yeah. to start. You know, putting our ideas that we had on paper and putting them onto on, into real life and putting them on a the plate and start tinkering with recipes. How did you? Did you always know that you wanted a place of your own? Um, you know, it's funny. I. It was around two thousand six, two thousand seven, when I was a chef de cuisine at Tocqueville. 
Um, oh God, I didn't yeah. know that. I loved Tokyo. <laughs> that was a really, that, that really special place. Yes. And I remember thinking, like, why aren't more people raving about this place? It's still so under the radar. It's just yeah. a magnificent fine dining French American restaurant right yeah. off of Union Square, and uh, you know that's where I, I really started to define and and soul search. And you know, I was there for almost four years, and it was a period of of finding out what I wanted to cook, simply yeah. stated. It's like, you know, I had trained in France and in French cuisine and, you know, years at Boulay and traveled to Paris and worked in Spain. And, and then, of course, um, had my childhood upbringing yeah. that was so rich in culture and Portuguese food. And Tocqueville was a kind of a, a – they allowed me to start tinkering with specials and, like, plugging, you know, little holes in the menu with, like, all these dishes. And then I, I got to a point where I was like, okay – here I am. Um, it's it's uh, four and a half years in. What's next? Yeah. And what next from what was next for me? I kept asking my questions like, do I want to find a position as a chef somewhere else in a hotel or another restaurant? And I started to you know research that and toy around with that idea. Then I was like, or do I try to make a really big leap and you know stand on the edge of a cliff and try to find right. partner, try to find try to find raise some money to, to try to open a restaurant, you know, and whatever that may be. Um, and I, I met with someone who just says, you know, you, you should open a Portuguese restaurant. That w- there wasn't at that time a <sighs> whole lot of that. I remember there was one Portuguese place that I would go to. It was, I don't remember the name, but it had something about bread in the title. That was Pao, P-A-O. Yes. Yes. I love that. And I didn't grow up with any sort of you know, Portuguese food around me. And I started getting used to those flavors and loving them. There was the, the chorizo, the, the, the saffron, like, it was, like, it was it like little, little shellfish. And I, I just remember thinking like the, it, it, it was sort of I always say like uh, when pe- you open up the door to Narnia and there's you open up the wardrobe and there's this whole world back there yes yeah you know pound pound de- definitely represented a represented a Portuguese cooking in a, in a very rustic honest authentic mm-hmm. way it was a very tiny restaurant yeah. that um, like you said what exactly what you described it was textbook Portuguese cooking yeah. and I remember going there in 1996 for mm-hmm. the first time when, when the original boule had closed right. on Duane Street um, I remember with my girlfriend at the time, we, we went out and I discovered there was this Portuguese restaurant called Pound. We're mm-hmm. like, what? It's a Portuguese restaurant in Manhattan? We're like, yeah, it's it's like, it's on the outskirts of West Soho, blah, 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 mm-hmm. let's go. So I went and I sat down and we had the Cataplana, which was mm-hmm. that copper vessel that you put all the shellfish in and, and it closes yeah. and you put on the fire and it, and it cooks like a, like a steamer, Yeah, basically. Um, and I remember having that dish and... It was very homey, and it took me right back to to being in Lisbon, to, to being back home in Connecticut at gatherings at the local Portuguese American club and having yeah. these rustic Portuguese dishes. I And I wonder why it is, because New York, we always think of it as this great bastion of all different kinds of cuisines, and some are very underrepresented, where they're sort of default in other, like not very... Not very far away. I know in Newark, there's a yes. pretty huge Portuguese yes. community. So what do you think was getting in the way at the time? Is that a funding thing? I, you know, it's, it's still something that I had a discussion with someone just actually just yesterday. I think it has a lot to do with the immigrants and how, how what, what the Portuguese-American culture or, let's say, community that um, – Lack that that exists in Newark, mm-hmm. New Jersey, yeah. but is very small or almost non-existent here in New York City. Yeah. Whereas if you look around, you go to Chinatown or Little Italy, mm-hmm. you have this big influx of Italians, right? Yeah. And I think that's you know the, the, the whole immigration of Italians coming to the city created this community and created Little Italy and created all these Italian restaurants. I don't think that the Portuguese had that same impact yeah. or had that same you know flood of people coming into New York. You know, and I think that that has a little bit to do with it. Um, but that's not to say that it, it's I, – I think there's a very bright future still for it. Oh. Where you're going to see more and more because of – I mean, yeah. I'm not I'm not being biased here or <laughs> no, anything. You, but, you've uh, been right at the forefront of it's, it. It's, it's – um, Portugal's hot right now. You know, mm-hmm. probably people are traveling to Lisbon yeah. and going to the south and the Algarve and what we like to call the Portuguese Riviera. So I think there's a, there's a lot mm-hmm. of – Portuguese chefs in training right now yeah. that I predict in five to ten years is just going to go. I'm not like, on this table with hope. You know, I hope and I, and I love to see that. And Lisbon right now, I, I go there very often, almost almost every month. And it's really? um, yeah, and it's like 
to see the the evolution, the, the the evolving of of the food scene in Lisbon itself, from you know the mm -hmm. the, the traditional is still representative, the, the classics are still representative, the grandma cooking is still mm -hmm. there, and then you have this whole wave of of young chefs um, that are creating their own identity, that are cooking this really exciting food at a moderate price point, and um, it's just a really fun scene, and it's 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 doing the same kind of thing that. You know, you're taking Portuguese recipes and tweaking them, and then they're creating their own voice and present them in a modern way. And the depth of flavor is there, and it's, it's just exciting to to see this all grow. That I mean, I, I think that's such a. I'm so excited for what happens next in that. Yeah. So at that time, you're doing a couple of scary things. You're opening your first restaurant, and you are out in the first wave of teaching New Yorkers who might not have a vocabulary for Portuguese food what that is. So how what's, what's your fear point? <laughs> and you know, it's funny. You it, it, it's, it's crazy. When we first, I remember sitting down with, um, with a company that was going to do our PR and trying to put together this bio, put together, you know, what is Aldea and what's it going to be and who am I? And we all came to the conclusion that, um, I was afraid to say it was a Portuguese restaurant because nobody knew what Portuguese food is. Right. So we started talking about terms like Iberian, and then <laughs> and then Iberian turned into okay, let's just call it a Mediterranean restaurant. And we settled on that, but we both know that if you talk about the Mediterranean spectrum, it's huge. You know, yeah. you're talking about you know, Morocco and across the, it's, it's a very big geographic region. So um, I kind of just let it go, and I, I don't remember exactly what the terminology was and how it was all released. I just went back and we opened the restaurant. And then we were reviewed very quickly by New York Magazine, um, Mr. Adam Platt, and then uh, soon after, Frank Bruni uh, with the New York Times. And it was just, it was Frank Bruni who right out the gate kind of said that Aldea is a Portuguese restaurant. Um, and the title of the review, I'll never forget, was From Lisbon with Friends. And he, I think Frank really nailed the essence of what the restaurant was and is today yeah. um and so that, that that you know full circle is like okay well we didn't want to call it a portuguese restaurant but the critics are calling it a portuguese <laughs> restaurant so there it is and like and at the time and, and even today and I, I think what drives us is our is the free spirit of yeah. what aldea is you know we're we're not a traditional portuguese restaurant and i always try to tell customers and you know, we do have people that come from Newark and, and the older generation. They're I was like, going to ask about that pressure to represent. Are yes. they going to be like, well, this doesn't taste like my grandma? <laughs> yeah, there's been a, there, there was a little bit of that mm -hmm. here and there, um, but I always I, I, I always communicated and expressed and and clarified that Aldea is quote unquote not a Portuguese restaurant by definition. It's a yeah. Portuguese inspired restaurant with a French. Well, I'm sorry, with a yes French technique, but with a free spirit. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is like, I was training at Tocqueville. I was a block away from the farmer's market. So yes, there was that farm the table um, thing going on. And what I wanted to do at Aldea was not have my hands tied to say, okay, mm -hmm. we're, we're, this is, we have to do this repertoire of Portuguese dishes and Portuguese cuisine. And we just, we were having a really fun time yeah. doing your dishes. You know, whereas I was, I was fresh from um, a stint at El Bulli in, in, in Spain. Yes, yeah, so you so come back with your head full of back, gels? Or? Yeah, a, a head full of, you know, a creative juices flowing yeah. and, like, no rules and, mm -hmm. like, all these new techniques and working with different, you know, what they call, I hate the word, and we all do, molecular gastronomy, but mm -hmm. just different tools yeah. in our toolbox of execution and techniques. Um, so the menu had an influx of that. And then it had really, and, and again, just to go back to what Frank Bruni wrote in the New York Times back yeah. in 2009, um, it was this, almost like this this pot of soup that had all these ingredients thrown in mm -hmm. of techniques and you know rustic uh, Portuguese flavors of just simple garlic, olive oil, paprika, lemon, parsley, and cilantro that was straight out of Sunday afternoon at my mom's house. Yeah. To then a dish that was like, wait, that's completely what you were what you learned or what. what El Bulli was like, yeah. um, and Martin Bernasetegui, which were, you know, and, and it was, it was like, it was dishes. I was like, I, I somehow was able to kind of bring it all together, but still, you know, and still 
you'll be able to eat this food and be like, okay, yeah, that's a very delicate dish and it has these raviolis that are exploding in your mouth. And then you have this duck rice, and we'll talk about that later, that was just so rustic and refined at the same time. So some years back, I'm trying to remember what year this was, I threw a CNN dinner and I wanted... Uh, we used to throw this this uh, series of dinners where we wouldn't tell people ahead of time uh, what was happening. We would just say, save the date, and we would have uh, chefs come in, and we would have a conversation around the table, and this particular one was about identity. And I thought, who do I want at this table? And it was Marcus Samuelson was yes. hosting it. And, oh, my gosh, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> and we had Eddie Wong <laughs> yes. who, and, uh, and Suvir Saran, mm-hmm. And you. Yes, I remember. And you made oh a dish. It was the fideos, wasn't it? Um, what was it? It wasn't was a rice dish. I don't do much with fideos. Oh, wait. Yes, it was It was a rice dish. So talk about, the, and, and it was very homey and you were very passionate about it. So why did you pick that dish to sort of represent who you are as a, as a person? Because quite simply, when I think of me as a chef and my identity, and my roots and how I was brought up, I go right, I, it takes me right into the kitchen on a Sunday afternoon, my mom cooking a pot of rice. And it's just simple, it's a tomato rice. It starts with olive oil, minced onion, um, garlic, dried bay leaf, tomato. So she's making this refugado, which is kind of, it's basically like a sofrito in Spanish cuisine. And she added, she added the rice and then the broth. And it was just this, very simple, clean tomato rice. And that kind of planted the seed and was always a reference point for me for everything I began to do at Aldea. And it was this, um, it, it, it just authentic. It was real. It was true. Mm-hmm. It, it was in my DNA. Yeah. It is in my DNA today. And it's like something that I really always sometimes forget. Yeah. Sometimes as chefs, we get. You know, it's about like, it, you know, we're creating a dish and then it's like sometimes we get lost in the process and overcomplicate things. And you always think that we have to add 10, 12 ingredients. And um, I always try to go back to the sense of growing up as a kid and through my teenage years in high school and what my mother would cook for my dad and my sister. And, you know, whether it was rice or roasted potatoes and salt cod, oh, my God, there was potatoes and salt cod on the table <laughs> at least three times a week. That sounds and, like heaven to me, really. Yeah. And, and um, that, to me, is, is what um, I am and who I am as a chef from an identity perspective. Yeah. It's, you know, like, it, it's, the, it's the memories of, of my mom cooking and then, then I, oh, and so forth, further on the line with my aunts and then family gatherings and holidays. That's... We can talk about that for five hours. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a thing that I really do come back to with with your food very much in in particular. That I see you check yourself and be like, is this still, you know, the person who I am? And coming back to those flavors, and there are two dishes in particular. I think of your fideos that you'd made and the egg tarts. Yes, there is this this simple, beautiful, almost like oozy egg tart. Yes, that feels like the most. <laughs> it feels like a little packet of love <laughs> in, in there. Can you? Uh, and and I, I could have those, and it, it just it speaks to me so much. Like you're when you go into the restaurant, it's it's several different. It feels like several different experiences because there's this fantastic bar up front where um, there was like a, a, a there was a salt and pepper uh, drink there that I <laughs> love very much. But and there's uh, you know other tables and then there's a chef's counter in the back so it feels like you can pick the experiences of but it feels like there are some through lines of it and that particular sort of like homey rustic thing feels like a statement of like you can be in the super polished place where there is this you know technique there's (laughs) there's you know serious technique in there but here's this this little talk about this thing (laughs) Well, I, it's it's definitely it's delicious. Simply put, <laughs> you know, I, I got to go back to my upbringing. Um, so my my aunt and my uncle ran a Portuguese bakery called International Bakery through um, the '70s and into the early '80s, and I think it still might be open today. I, different ownership, of course. Um, but I remember being introduced to this tart that I didn't like. <laughs> I honestly didn't like it. It was just brought home in a paper paper cardboard box of six pieces and it was this it it looked like a little pie that was burned on top um with this kind of soggy crust 
and I would taste it as a kid and be like, yeah, okay, it's, it's not. And then I <laughs> look and God, we don't appreciate yeah, the things from childhood. It wasn't. It, we don't really. I didn't really appreciate it. And it wasn't until my first visits later on in the late '90s to Lisbon, mm-hmm. then going to the town of Belang, okay. uh, about a 20 minute cab ride and down out of downtown Lisbon to um, uh, Fabrica de Pastel de Nata, Belang, and it's basically where these tarts were born. Mm-hmm. Um, in a monastery um, in 19th century, 1830s, 40s, we're talking about. So, a quick little tidbit on that is the nuns in this monastery used to use egg whites to starch their clothes, and then they would result in egg yolks. And then they're like, "What are we going to do with these egg yolks?" And, and basically, they started to create these pastries. The monks began to create these these Portuguese. Um, desserts using yolks and then there was sugar and then this tart was born then um, by making this pastry uh, pastry crust the dough and it was rolled out and you you put in a mold and you make you pour the custard of of eggs and sugar and you blast it in the super hot oven for about 10 minutes and that's the the egg custard tart Um, that's the historic that's how it was born back then so when i when i went to that place um in in uh in Lisbon, probably around 1998, 1999, for the first time, and I, I look at these things, and there's a big line outside, and and there's you walk in, and there's just shelves of port wine, and you can smell these things coming out of the oven, and people are dusting them with with cinnamon powder and sugar, powdered sugar, and they're all standing up and eating these things. I'm like, yeah, I want to try one, and I look <laughs> at them, I'm like, well, these look really familiar, and um, I remember eating it for the first time, and I was like. Oh, <laughs> Whoa! Wait, this is not nothing like what I was introduced to the crap back home. Oh my god! Like that and, uh, Madeline moment. But yeah, like, it was a ma- exactly. It was a Madeline. It was like a souffle moment. It was like this warm, oozy chocolate cake moment. You know, it's like mm-hmm. or, or a beautiful chocolate chip cookie. It's like this is delicious. It was crispy. It was runny, slightly runny in the middle. The flavor was intense, and the cinnamon came through, and it was just. I was like, just stop for one second. And I, I remember being with, um, I think it was with my sister and, and and my cousins. And I just looked, I'm like, this, I remember like, well, this has nothing to do what we were eight on East Liberty Street back in Danbury, Connecticut in late, in the, you know, in 1985 for the first time. It's totally different. And um, at that time I was still training. You know, I think I was, I was at Boulay and I went back to New York City and, you know, that stayed in the back of my mind. And then Fast forward, you know, to to it was when I had actually Lupolo was when we started to really bake them here, and and as simple as they are, they're very difficult to do right to get it to get it right because it's 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 about the dough, it's about oven temperatures, it's about the proper custard and the ratios. So it took a lot of time, and sometimes we still tinker it with it today. Um, it, as simple as that as that dessert is, as delicious as it is, I mean, it's funny looking at your face right now. You're like glowing. I wish we brought some. Oh my gosh, they they, <laughs> they, they really are just such a statement of, of self, and you look at it and it looks so humble and so. Yes, it just very like humble. Kind of epitomizes your, yeah. your cooking. That they're all, like the surprises in there. Yes, yes. It's a it's it's a really truly beautiful thing. Right. And so when when did you start cooking in New York? I started cooking in New York City in 1994. Okay. Um, I was uh, through after after culinary school. I was working at the Stonehenge Inn in Ridgefield, Connecticut, um, cooking classical textbook French food. Um, you know, literally torneying vegetables in buckets of potatoes. <laughs> I mean, this was as classic as can be, camp, yeah. and, and making hollandaise and 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 making beef Wellington. I mean, it was more Americana touches of Americana dishes as well, but. Um, there was a, uh, a I, I saw a, I went to a local cafe, and I saw that there was going to be a cooking class in New York City, um, that I wanted to go visit, and it was when I was first introduced to to David Boulay. Mm-hmm. Um, at the time, I then I took a job working at Tropica under Chef Ed Brown, um, and he hired me as a butcher. And I was did, like, <laughs> did you know how to be a butcher? No, not really. I had a <laughs> I had a slight nag for it, but I, I was close yeah. to train. But it was not only butchering but mostly fish from all over the world okay. in Hawaiian fish so I got you know had a an opportunity to have immersed being immersed in the world of seafood and uh, filleting f- small fish to big fish so it was it was a great learning step you know so was, I spent so much time just cooking 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 in techniques yeah. at the stove 
and very little time just staying away from the stove and like in this little refrigerated area and just butchering fish all day. So, but at the same time, let's 90s kitchen culture yeah. in New York City. That is a rough damn place to yeah. be. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, I've I've talked about it with uh, with a lot of people. There's there's some behavior that you know we can look at now that is, and it's a, a it was a, a cultural thing coming from the European kitchens, of speaking to people abusively, of physical trials and all that. And I feel like people are finally starting to come up for air and model different behaviors. Can you talk about your journey? You don't have to name names necessarily, but kitchens you've been through, what you had to learn and unlearn. Yes. Um, the nineties were a different period and in part of early 2000 as well. You know, it, I, I it was uh, this aura or, or just way of life or way of kitchen culture where yes, we, it was you were always afraid to get yelled at. You were always, you are always like, you know, trying to keep your head down and, and do your job. But I mean, I was, just, I was brought up in environments where I had, I had, I had both, both exposures, you know, a quiet atmosphere. Um, there was, there was a, a time and especially in, uh, what specifically stands out to me in my time in Spain where, um, and in, and in Paris where there was a lot of yelling where if mm -hmm. there wasn't yelling, then the people that weren't yelling got yelled at. Because you're supposed to be yelling. <laughs> it was really silly, yeah. and uh, and it was you walked into this um, um, area of you walk into the kitchen where it's like okay, this atmosphere is what I'm looking for. Is like you walk into this atmosphere of fear in a way, yeah, and and focus and quiet and and, and calmness, but at the same time, it's like you're. I remember back then it was like you, we were excited and, and we wanted to learn from these masters, but at the same time it was just this, this okay, what are we going to yell about next and what can possibly go wrong? And I, There was always something that went wrong. Um, and I think that, you know, looking back at it now, it's like so foreign to me. It's It was just, it's almost comedic in a way. It's like it was so unnecessary. Mm. Um, I could, I mean, there were, there were moments with, I mean, even there's days today where, you know, we can lose our temper, but you kind of manage it in a different way. Yeah. I think back then it was just all hell break loose and you, there was no, there was no control. And I think that's where there was a lot of throwing and, and degrading of character and, and disrespect towards, you know, towards us, us cooks, both male and female. And it was just, um, a brutal environment at times where it was, there was a little bit of physical abuse, but more mental abuse where the chefs would, would degrade you and make you feel like shit. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's just, it's accepted at that point for somebody yeah. in, a, in, a, in a very military yeah. way that's sort of breaking you down so you you follow the route. And But it's accepted and people just went along with it because it wasn't questioned. We didn't know any other way. Yeah, yeah. so it was, it was like, that's just how it is, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's when I remember telling my parents and, and our other colleagues back in the early 90s that I was going to be studying to be a chef. And they were like, really, do you want to expose yourself to A, the long hours, working in a basement, poor ventilation, no social life, um, yes. <laughs> uh, abuse, uh, verbal abuse, yelling, screaming, uh, stress, uh, lack of sleep, poor diet, all, you know, right, you know, checking all those marks off. <laughs> right. And I was like, I listened to all this and I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And it was to me. It was I was more focused on the the art of it, yeah. the, being able to see the beauty. Because that's the thing. At the end of the day, it's like we were getting yelled at, but then we were seeing the results of it. We're yeah. seeing how busy the restaurant was, um, the accolades, the how we were seeing us grow as as cooks. And as much as we were being verbally degraded you know there was that little you know we're still kind of feeling a little bit more confident like you know what maybe today i won't get yelled at because of this and uh, this will be better and there was there was definitely some times where we were complimented you know and, mm -hmm. and uh, but it was like it was it was boot camp it was like going through the ranks paying your dues and that's just how it is how it was I, I see a lot of chefs sort of uh, like especially like late 30s mid 40s over 40s seeing they having a moment where they realized you know the kitchen doesn't have to be like that that they you can mentor and lead in a different kind of way because you're really invested in the people coming up behind you and you you, you know you get past your 20s or something you think like oh, I might do this I want to leave a legacy 
of that. How did you become throughout all of this, become a, a leader of people? And how do you sort of model this behavior for the people who work for you? You know, it's, it's really, we have a responsibility, of course, to pass on the knowledge, pass on um, everything that we've learned, right? Uh, as, as, as cooks and as chefs. It's more than food though. It's more than food. It is, it's, it's about work ethic. It's about, um, communication which can be really tough that is so tough it's so tough chefs are in the kitchen because they don't want to talk to people outside. that is and that's and even i will i will openly say even today i still stumble with proper communication mm-hmm. um and dominique will probably <laughs> you know it, it's just it's it's just sometimes all my mind is racing from all operations of aldea yeah from the outside sidewalk the vestibule to the flowers to the bar to the music to um the administrative, the bill pay. I mean, like it's all happening, and, and like, yeah. but then I just said, oh my god, I want to do something with scallop this dish today, and I was thought about like how okay, like but then I have to communicate to my sous chef or my chef de cuisine, and then my cooks. It's like sometimes I just don't get to that point, yeah, or I'll forget that. I thought I told you. I'm like, no, I didn't tell you. Oh my god, no, I didn't tell. I I, I, had, this, I had this conversation in my head, right? That we're <laughs> gonna do something. So yeah, I mean, it's very important. I think it's definitely still something that I strive to improve on yeah. today. But yeah, us chefs are introverts. We're, you know, we a lot of times will like do things ourselves and forget that we do have a staff <laughs> that we're supposed to be teaching, you know, and, and I think it, it's it's challenging. It really is challenging. Because, yes, I mean, in Aldea, Aldea's environment since day one, I chose to have an open kitchen. And yes, we, you know, we talk to the customers and customers interact with the cooks. And I think it's a, it's a great environment, but you know, it is, it is, it's challenging. Yeah. It's a challenging, um, aspect of mentoring, of teaching, of, of being that leader where, um, it isn't easy and it's not, and a lot of times it's not taught. Sometimes you got to figure it out yourself, you know, and you're going to have 150 reservations and, you have to orchestrate your team and make sure everybody's mm-hmm. ready and, and get it right. I mean, we we make it happen, and I think um, I'm so great. I'm very, very. I'm so grateful for the team that I have at Aldea throughout the years. Today, five years ago, ten years ago, that you know we've had kids, um, uh, women and men that have come through, and that we have today that um, are amazing. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, they're they're really amazing. They're ambitious. They want to learn. They they, um, I'm giving them a voice to create. Um, and that's one thing that I, I can stop for a second and say that one thing that I've, I've, I'm proud to say that I've learned to do is give them an opportunity to, to put something on a plate themselves mm-hmm. and, um, and taste it and, and make it maybe either it makes it onto the menu or it, or we talk about it and we, we tweak it. You know, that, I think that to me is important. It's stuff that I want to keep um, growing on. And I think that if we if we as chefs or myself as an individual in Aldea, if I don't give them an opportunity to apply what they're learning mm-hmm. or experimenting, because, you know, at the end of the day, it is about technique and fundamentals. And then it's, it's harmony of flavors and seasoning. You know, it's it's it can get it can get complicated. But at the end of the day, folks, it's just food. Yeah. You know, it has to taste good. You know, it has yeah. it has to taste good, and yes, it has to be that sense of creativity. But at the end of the day, like for me, deliciousness is a lot more deliciousness and technique and and temperature is much more important than it being like a super creative, intricately tweezered food mm-hmm. on a plate. You know, which we do, but the number one thing it has to be delicious, and I think that is 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 what I try to do at Aldea is is whether I create something or or my team creates something is we always ask ourselves, does it taste good? Yeah. And then we talk about, okay, is it interesting? And then we ask why, why is this dish this? You know, wh- why, what's the approach? What's the idea? What's the theme? Mm-hmm. I come out of there eating your food and I feel really happy. I don't think I've ever, Thank you. I, don't think awesome I've, I don't think I've ever left there feeling anything other than, than joyous. Cool. Um, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Uh, that means a lot. It's, That's awesome. it's really very true. And you know, and it comes through in, in the team too. Um, because I know that mentorship is so important to you, there's a question that I am asked a lot by uh, chefs and and stuff. Um, How, when you see somebody who works for you 
and they're not in a good place. They're, they've, you can tell that there's something on their mind. There's something, you know, some situation. How do you address it with them? Like, hey, I'm worried about you. You're off your game. You're, you're whatever. How do you take care of people when it's, it's not just the food? It might be showing up on the plate because of that. But how do you spot that and have the, the moment um, with them? Well, I think the number one thing is the responsibility is showing that, that we care and that we can listen to, to what's going on. Offering, offering support, you know, because there are people that might want to talk about what's up or might mm-hmm. not. Um, yeah. You know, over the years, um, over the years in New York and, and being a chef, whether a chef de cuisine um, uh, at other restaurants, we're opening Aldea or presently Aldea, you know, yes, we do encounter days when there's, you know, a cook is just not there um, mentally and you can see the quality of their work is deteriorating or they're just not, they're not performing. Um, I do feel, you know, of course, it's, it's our responsibility as, as uh, the leaders in the kitchen to, to notice that, of course, and you, you, either myself or my sous chef will grab them and talk to them and be like, hey, what's mm-hmm. going on? And hopefully we can fix it. That's usually the goal. But yes, I think morale, morale is, is super important. I think I'd be able to, being able to create an environment in your kitchen where um, you're you're available, yeah, is important. Um, available to communicate and not just treat people like they're robots, like they're just coming in with two hands and chopping vegetables and cooking things and then getting a paycheck and going home. But um, we as leaders have to be sensitive to to the well-being of our team. And I think that um, I've learned that over the years that um, it's important because you're gonna, you're gonna, at the end of the day, you're gonna get, you're gonna get the most out of, you're gonna get the best out of people mm-hmm. if they're feeling their best and if they're able to, to execute in the right environment. So where does, does where does this happen? Does this happen on a walk, in the walk-in, in the <laughs> office? Like, so where do you, where do you? I think I've done everything. I know we, <laughs> we have a private dining room. I've had meetings in. We, yeah. sometimes it's a walk outside. Sometimes it's downstairs. Uh, our walk-in is pretty tight, so it, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't work in the walk-in. But you know, it, it over the years the the chats have happened um, in different places. But it's the chat. It's the opportunity for communication. Is being available. Yeah, being available to me is the number one thing. Um, and as busy as my schedule is, um, both inside and outside the restaurant, um, I have to say that I. I I always tell my cooks, no matter what, whatever it is, not only my cooks, but also my my, my entire, every soul that works at Aldea, um, I've always said, anything you need to talk about, just mm-hmm. grab me. You know, text text me if I'm not on in the premise or say, hey, chef, I want to talk to you. I mean, I, I need, I, I'm res- I have that responsibility to be available, yeah. period. It just, it has to be that way. Yeah. It has to be that way. That's a... That is a responsible way to uh, approach that. Because you know, I, I, we've I've worked for people that you know, it's like, yeah, you were just you're a cook, you're a sous chef, yeah, you, you know. need to perform and you need to execute this menu, and um, I only give two shits about how you're feeling. Yeah, just give me the, the halibut cooked perfectly, the, the shut up, season and cook. properly. <laughs> yeah, the shut up and cook, um, the shut up and cook aspect of it all. I've been there. Um, and you, you plow through it, and then you you, know, you end up, you pay your dues there, and you move on, and you, and you get more of it somewhere else, or, or you don't. But I think this day and age is different. I think this time... It's changing. It's changing. It really it's changing. The industry has changed in, in many ways, you know, and, I'm, and I, I think back in, from culinary school to where I am now, the 20, almost 25 years, whatever, doing the math, but um, <laughs> it's, it's uh, the industry has gone through a lot, a lot. It, it it really has, and I, I feel like that seeing young chefs as a totality of humanity is really the the way forward. And you you had to talk your staff through shutting a restaurant, um, which, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, can you talk about how much that sucked? Awful, yeah. awful. You know, sorry um, to bring this up, but no, 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 no. It's, 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 it's fine. It was it was heart wrenching for me first to accept the fact that I had to close a restaurant. Um, it was real uh, estate related. It was real estate. It was real estate related, and you know, sitting down with my partner and, and talking it through and, and looking at the table and saying, okay, we have ego and then we have business decisions, and it was like I had to let go of 
the love, the ego, the uh, the, the craft, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful the pride, nice and all that stuff because of this fucking business thing, and it was like or this real estate thing, and it was it was really, it was angering, it was um, frustrating, and and all of that. But in the, the day, it's like I can be very spiritual and religious. I think when when God closes a door, He opens a window, mm -hmm. and I know that that window will open again. Yeah. And yeah, it's been a year, a little over a year plus since I've closed Lupolo, but you know, I since then I was, you know, I, that gave me the opportunity to revisit Aldea again yeah. and say, okay, hey, where we are, and it's a ten year restaurant. It's beautiful, and it's still my baby, and I, yeah. it gave me the opportunity to like come back to that full time again and uh, really refocus on it and, and do it. And just just today, just this morning, I was there um, at like nine fifteen, and I just stopped for one second, and and I was the only one in the kitchen. I was like. I really love that restaurant. Yeah. I'm always going to love that restaurant. And I think that, um, and I was playing around with it. I started uh, playing the seed for a new dish, and um, I just got these, a wonderful bag of, um, of, of oats from uh, Wild Hive via, via Upstate Farms. And it was just, I just had this moment where it's like, I just love doing this. Yeah. I love doing it. So, you know, yes, we. Cl I closed Lupolo, and did you bring people over? Were you yeah, yeah, yeah. I was able to. That's... I was able to bring people over to Aldea. I mean, Aldea is not a big restaurant. Um, you know, we're only a staff of ten in the kitchen, but I was able to to plug some people, and I was able to um, uh, recommend and set people up in other other locations. Those that wanted to. That's um, great. Some people moved, and some people went in different directions. But um, yeah, you know, it it, it was a bummer, but. Um, I know that I know that we will do something um, again. Um, I, I, I during this, this time of reflection and 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 break and just having Aldea uh, right now um, gave me an opportunity to really um, revisit revisit what it is that I really makes me happy. Um, not only as a chef, but as a as as a human, as a man in like my personal life and like yeah. thinking about where I want to go. You know what quality of life I want to yeah. have, and it's like, do I want to have that empire of restaurants? Maybe, sure. I mean, you know, there's that financial aspect of it, and but then there's also everything else that comes with it. You know, God only knows where I'm gonna go from here. Right. Right. As that, but I'm if I'm able to cook and 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 execute a craft that I love, whether it's one restaurant, two, three, or five, you know, I don't have a numerical application to it. You know, I just for me, it's more about um, waking up in the morning. Trying, you know, being healthy and, and and teaching people and making sure that my staff is happy, you know, and, and being able to provide for them, and then and then nourish my customers. I think that's that's to me is is the most important part of the puzzle, you know. And when we open something else again, it's going to be the same thing. It's yeah. going to be a, me apply, you know. Making sure that it's a great space, making sure that um, I uh, the concept makes me happy, and because I need to be fulfilled, it's a it's a it's a a little bit of a complicated puzzle where it's like okay, you have to give the customers what they want, and you have to feed the demographics, and and be that neighborhood restaurant and all that stuff. But at the same time, I have to be happy myself. Yeah. Because and my staff, you know, I have to put everything together and make sure that the staff is happy. So, you know, to talk about you know the closure was a bummer, but then it's also I was able to grow yeah. at the same time, and and um, it gives me an opportunity to reflect. And I travel, and you know, um, I, I have you know a lovely girlfriend, and I just you know I'm, I'm thinking about what my future is like. Yeah, um, that's important to me. Uh, selfishly, I want to say I would just want to walk into somewhere that smells like that restaurant again because the smell was beautiful. <laughs> I love the scent of it. The beauty of a wood fire. It was gorgeous. How did uh, <sighs> did running get you through? Running seems is so fundamental to you. Can did is was that part of the bridge? When I'm not through? injured, <laughs> right? But it, you said you're training for a marathon. But is that part of the the sort of bridge through? Yes, you know when I opened. Um, Back in 2015, when I opened uh, Lupolo, I was at a point in my life that the industry had beaten me up. I think um, um, the way, the stereotype that we fall into of of uh, the socializing and staying out late night drinking and partying and all that stuff, it started in, in, in burning the can on both ends and sleeping very little and push, push, push. It was like that, that constant thrive. I just um, got to a point where I just hit a wall and it was like, you know, and... and my girlfriend at the time was just like, you know, you, you can't keep going on like this. 
um, eventually, you know, this is, this is deteriorating everything around you. And um, I know it was a conversation with my mom. I, my dad passed away as well. Um, he wasn't able to see Lupolo, and he knew about it. Um, and I just remember hitting a, I, I had a, I remember being on the phone with my mom, and it was just like this light bulb went off. And I just said, okay, I got to turn a corner now. What's next? And I wasn't feeling well. And I just knew that I had to change how I was living my life. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah. And it was, and it was, it was diet. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was the staying out too late, not taking my body, drinking heavily, the stereotype of a chef, you know. And it was like, it was at the time I went for a small little run in Central Park. Um, it was a 5K, and I ran a mile. I remember stopping and saying, oh, my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. And, and <laughs> the first it, one, it, I can't even. It was that first one. It was like, no, yeah. don't stop. Keep going. And I went, and I ended up finishing the race. And then I went you to finished. Aston. I finished That's the amazing. race. Yeah, finishing was huge. And I, and I finished the race, and then I um, – Went to Aspen a few months later oh. for the classic, and they do the five k. Yeah, right? I always think people are nuts who do that because the altitude. It was crazy. <laughs> oh, completely crazy. But I remember being out there, and I was it was a second race, and I remember doing that. I didn't stop at all, didn't mm-hmm. walk, and, and and ran it, and um, and then it was this this stupid little Nike app called Nike Run Club. Oh, people love that. And it's it's amazing. And then uh, I was with my cousin Diane back in Connecticut um, over the weekend, and she showed it to me, and then we went for a run. And then that was it. Um, that's your thing. And that was it. And that's what kind of that planted the seed. And I just started forming new habits, new, um, just new things to do with my spare time. Uh, the very little spare time, right? <laughs> right. And don't get me wrong. Um, but but is, is that how you charge your battery? Yes. Yeah. And I think um, it was it was the sense of accomplishment of finishing a race, a sense of accomplishment of of setting out on a race, of setting out on a run, not a race, but just um, in the neighborhood and saying, okay, I'm gonna go out and run three miles. I'm gonna go around out and do five today. Um, and let's see if I can, you know, I'll stay at this pace, you know, and then, or I'll speed up. And just, it, for me early on, it was more about like just setting out a goal and accomplishing it. And whether it was three miles or seven or 10, it was a sense of accomplishment um, after uh, finishing, um, the mileage, yeah. whether it was five miles and hitting stop on, at that point I was using this, I had the big bulky phone on my arm, you know, with a <laughs> band on it. And it was like, Oh, you stop. and I both have these. And then I, and then I had the airpiece and the Nike, the Nike, uh, like it was kind of like a Siri application. And she would say, you have finished four or five, seven miles. And it was just like, it was pretty cool. Yeah. And I was like, uh, I'm going, this is like, this is going back four years ago now. And that's kind of how it started, and it yeah. was it was that new sense of, of accomplishment, and it and it started to feed uh, my energy level. It started mm-hmm. to give me clarity of mind. It started to, I mean, as we know, any kind of um, athletic or cardiovascular activity is, is a natural antidepressant. It yeah. fires up your endorphins. It increases your, your serotonin. It just does all great things for your mental state. And that's kind of how it started. And I was like, wow, this feels great. And runner's yeah. high is real. Yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of how it started. I feel like chef, chef brain, as I'm, I'm finding out talking to more and more chefs about this, chef brain and this kind of extreme exercise thing seems to really meld in a way that's yeah. surprising to me. I've, right. I've seen, you know, you do this, Seamus Mullen do this, Matt Jennings. Yeah. And I, amazing I, athletes. I mean, it's so yeah. cool when I think about those names, my chef colleagues that are just in super duper shape, you know, uh, Seamus as a cyclist, um, and my, and, um, Matthew Jennings, I never met him in per, I think we're uh, just in passing, love but that man. I know his story and, yeah. I, and I've read up on him and, and he's just an amazing human being, family man, Truly. and just uh, the seeing his voice, his, his journey yeah. um, of where he is today is, is, is amazing. It's, it serves as a big inspiration to us all. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I, that pumps me up and makes me really happy that we have people in our industry mm-hmm. uh, that are flipping that stereotype upside down and saying, no, here we are. We are fit. We are happy. Uh, you know, we were, we're taking care of our families. Yeah. We're, we're, we're taking care of ourselves. And it's I think <laughs> it's very difficult, but it's not impossible. Yeah. You know, yes, the industry is always going to be long hours and stress and, you know, the restaurant dining hours are never going to change. But I think if you, if you set yourself up properly and you have a good team and you take care of your team and you start taking care of yourself, it all comes together. Yeah. It has to. Yeah. It has to. 
there's going to be a future for this. <laughs> <laughs> totally. And I am so grateful to you for leading the way on this. And because you do things for other people, I have a question that I like to ask people. Um, you know how uh, Oprah loves this, the secret where you say out into the universe the thing that you want. And, w and saying it <laughs> makes it real so then other people can help you get there. George Mendes, what do you want? Uh, continued happiness. Continued health. Um, friendships. Yeah. Friendships. Um, more time with my loved ones. You know, more time with... Uh, just, just making sure that my team is well, you know. I think, I think, um, just being, uh, being grateful. I'm being grateful for for things that I have in my life today, you know. That, you know, I I have a place to live. That I have, that I have beautiful pets. That I have friends. That I have family, and and um, I think that's really important for me. So, just just continued happiness and and continued health. I think that for me is 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 the most important. I want ten more years of years of LDA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, greedily. <laughs> yes. Well, we we currently do have five more years on the lease, so we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, you know, it's New York is a very challenging market. You it know, is. it's yeah, it, it is, and I I can't say what a tremendous accomplishment it is to make. Ten. Congratulations! Oh, thank on you. That that is that is. It's huge. been a roller coaster ride. Yeah, a dark one at times. <laughs> <laughs> but I I but I. I don't know. I want everybody who's listening to this to go in and feel the joy and eat one of the egg tarts. Yes, the egg tarts. <laughs> we have. Oh my! I have five questions that I ask of every guest. Sure. And um, <laughs> like to see where you take these. What is the last meal that you had that made you emotional? Ooh, the last meal that made me emotional. Um, I just came back from Barcelona and I ate at Enigma. Um, Albert Adrian is. You know, Enigma is a continuation um, or has the same um, energy or, or on that same road as El Bulli yeah. was that closed back in 2011. And um, the dishes that I was eating there was just like, wow, the purity, the joy. Um, it, was an, it was feelings of elation and just like, wow, this is just fun stuff delicious stuff to eat and very simple. I mean, he was doing simple things with the squid, you know, calamari. It's like, okay, it, this is just a piece of squid, but it was just perfectly done. And it was, there was some creativity to it. And then it was, you know, there was a lot of dishes that had some, um, uh, a lot of dishes that had heavy Japanese influence. Um, I, I just got super, super excited and it just fires me up and inspires us when you eat things like that. I love that. What is the last meal that somebody cooked for you in their home? Uh, last meal that somebody cooked for me in their home was uh, my friends uh, Gerard and Lourdes. Um, believe it was a pasta dish, or no? I think it, no. We were outside on the roof deck. Uh, from what I remember, that one sticks out the most. But actually, in addition to that, was over the holidays. What? Who cooked for you? Um, my mother. And my sister. Oh, people don't like to cook for chefs, but family does. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my mom is my mom is always my sister. Actually, my mom is always better than me in everything she cooks. <laughs> <Could> she <laughs> I'm do supposed a, to say I have to say that, could right? Could she do a guest stint <laughs> at, at the restaurant? <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, she's she's been in the restaurants. Yeah. Really? Oh yeah. And how does she feel about? She would say, "What is that?" <laughs> My mom's famous words. What is, what is that? that? What is that? What is that? Oh my! <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to eat her food now. Yeah. What's your comfort food? Mm. There's a lot. Um, I love love toast coming out of the oven, <gasps> smothering it with almond or peanut butter and some jam, and sometimes it's butter. That's my earliest uh, food memory as a child. Yeah. Um, we used to have these Portuguese, uh, they were called grinders, which was kind of like a hoagie. And it would, my my uh, babysitter at the time, I'm going back to 19, in the 1970s, and it was bread that was sliced, smothered with butter, toasted in the oven with the butter. This is a very important step. Mm. It toasted in the oven with the butter and it would come out, and I could still smell that aroma. Oh. And for me, that's the most ultimate comfort food for me is toast. That sounds so good. <laughs> um, 
what musician, this is also putting it out into the oh universe, my God. would you, what living musician would you want to cook for and what would you cook for them? Um, the lead, the, well, I'm super obsessed with a band called Tame Impala right now. Oh, uh, yes. They're crazy amazing. They've been out for yeah. a while. Um, they're in this, this genre called psychedelic rock. Mm -hmm. Um indie band and oh my god I'm, I'm my get brain. on your leopard i believe <laughs> yeah i mean they're uh the lead singer that it's not it tame impala is a one-man band he i didn't know that. and i forgot i'm, I'm drawing a crazy mm -hmm. if someone can shout out his name right now i'd be so happy um australian and he produces plays every single instrument yeah writes his own songs does everything and then when they tour He's got other other um, uh, artists come in from another band called Pond, and they do a show. Pond? That goes back a minute. Yeah, and... Pond. And um, I would love to sit down and break bread with this guy, and he's a genius. He's a musical genius. His music is crazy addicting. Um, yeah, it has a psychedelic genre, but it's also it, it's it's poppy, it's dancey at the same time. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's this is this is an example of someone who is evolving as an artist. Um, and I kind of like it, it resonates with me because we as chefs also have to evolve and grow as artists too. And I think um, it's 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 just amazing to listen to. And they're, they're gonna, I'm gonna go watch them play in it in um, in Atlanta in May, and uh, pretty pumped for that. So that's someone who I would want to sit down and, and have a meal with. Hey, Tame Impala guy. Tame Impala. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Um, and a uh, final question. You have five minutes for self-care. What do you do? Five minutes for self-care. Uninterrupted. Long shower that leads into a soaking in Epsom salt bath. Yeah. You were the second person who wrote it. Mm -hmm. Invoke the shower. <laughs> <laughs> Any products or anything? Uh, just a good, just a good. Uh, I, I like, I like, uh. The different brands of soaps out there, but uh, what I'm really into right now is Lilabo makes a great. Oh God, this Lilabo makes a great um, sh uh, shower gel soap. Um, and I got to be honest with you, like the Epsom salts, there's a <laughs> few. There's a vino that is just great. There's like an oatmeal one or whatever, uh, <laughs> from what I remember. So my I, my cab my my bathroom cabinet right now is a disastrous mess. Like I, I open the door and everything just falls out of it. Um, but if it's it's um, those things are. For me, uh, the ultimate relaxing, especially after coming back from a run, yeah, uh, like a long run when we're training, we have this long run once a week where you can do anything between 10 to 21 miles. When you come back from that, A, you're hungry, B, you want to shower and have just sit in that room for <laughs> a half an hour and just come back to life because it's so grueling. It's exhilarating. You're, you're high off the run, but being able to take a shower and so and soak is, is awesome. Dear Lalabo and Tame Impala, <laughs> <laughs> come and sponsor George. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm so pissed at myself that I can't think of the artist's name right uh, now. We will put it in the notes, but thank What's you. What's that? Kevin Parker. Kevin Parker. <laughs> Damn it. See? I know that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. And th Kevin Parker, man, let's let's come to Waldea. Let's 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 chat, man. You're fucking awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I want this to happen for you. And, yes. And thank you please. so much for for coming in today. Thank you so much, Joe. It's so amazing to chat with you, Kat. It's this, always a joy. It's such always a, a pleasure. Joy. To me. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much today for our guest George Mendez and you can find him on all the socials at Aldea NYC. Uh, Aldea NYC and Gio Mendez and uh, your book is My Portugal Recipes and Stories wherever books are sold and you can find links to everything in today's episode description including probably to Tame Impala's website <laughs> <laughs> thank you to our producers Jennifer Martinick Alicia Cabral and Amy Frank thank you to Douglas Wagner for our delightful theme song if you like what you heard please tell a friend write a review or rate us and if there is something you'd like to talk about or a guest you'd like to hear from please let us us know you can find me on twitter at kitten with a whip find out more about the show and catch up on all the episodes at foodandwine.com and at food and wine's youtube page thanks for listening and take good care of yourself until the next time